Well, this morning we're going to be looking at um, a portion of Romans, book of Romans, chapter 15. Uh, we're going to look at, uh, we'll read, we're going to read verses 1 through 4, but we're going to look primarily this morning at verse 3, because in verse 3, what Paul is enforcing upon us, and when I say enforcing, I mean this is the Lord's will. This is what he wants us to do. This is for our good, and this is the loving thing to do. He's going to point to Jesus and say Jesus did precisely the same thing. So what we want to do is look at the fact that we are called to follow Jesus' example, to realize that this is what Jesus did, and to follow that example again by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's, we, we get sort of a summary statement in the first couple of verses of chapter 15 of what Paul is dealing with in chapter 14. This evening we'll read chapter 14 because that's what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, but again, as I mentioned this morning, we won't read that this morning because we're going to be looking at how Jesus conducted his life, what it was he was after and what he wasn't after in the things that he did. So Romans 15, beginning in verse 1, let me just read the first four verses. Paul writes, now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So I do believe that Paul in chapter 14 is giving us a principle. He summarizes it in the first verse of chapter 15. He broadens it a bit more in the second verse and then points to Jesus as our example. So that's what we want to see this morning. Jesus as our example. Now, Again, I've already mentioned this, but I'll just say it again. Our, our Savior, the Lord Jesus, obviously lived perfectly in every area of his life. He always obeyed his Father. He always loved him with his whole heart. And he did only that which he knew would please the Father. And, of course, he always loved his neighbor um, as he knew his neighbor should love him. You know, we've often heard that statement, uh, I'll do unto others as they do unto me. Well, that's, that's not what our Lord says. We should do unto others what we would have them do to us. But even more so, we should do unto others what Jesus has done for us because he is the one who has loved his neighbor perfectly. Now, Jesus didn't do this just to qualify as our Savior. You know, he didn't obey just to do this. As essential as his obedience is, to his work of saving us, of rescuing us. He also did this to show us how we are to live, to give us an example that we are to follow. And he did it to make it possible for us to live in this way through his Holy Spirit. Remember, through what Jesus has done. He has purchased the Spirit, the return of the Holy Spirit, and he can give us the Holy Spirit, and that's what he does, of course, in salvation. But because Jesus is an example to us, that's because that is also the reason why he lived as he did, that's why we also, before we settle on how we should apply the Bible to our lives, we should look at how Jesus did it. This is also why the New Testament writers often point to Jesus' example to prove that we should do this in a certain way. Well, that's exactly what Paul does in our passage this morning. Now, today, as I've also already mentioned, we're looking at the example that Jesus gives us in the area of motivation, why he did the things that he did, what caused him to make the choices that he made, because he is calling us to have the same motivation. Now, a good place to start would be to look at what it is that motivates us now. You know, what is it that you want from the choices that you make? Well, I think there's really only one answer for all of us, and I believe it's a universal answer. What we're all seeking is happiness. 
It's something that we all want. And I think if we had our way, we'd, we'd have it all the time. We choose what we think will make us the happiest, will be best for our well-being, maybe best for the well-being of those we care about. And of course, when people that we care about are doing well, that also makes us happy and it pleases us. So we make choices that will make us the happiest um, from the choices that we have at any given time because you know, we, we may not always be able to choose what would give us the ultimate happiness as it were in this world, but we do have choices among varying degrees of happiness. Well, happiness is the reason that we chose to trust in the Lord Jesus by His grace, but it was still a choice that we made when He was offered to us in the gospel. Uh, suffering forever for our sins under God's wrath in hell didn't sound like a very pleasant thing to us, but living in a perfect world of love, one that is filled with love, with the one whom we love more than any other, and with many others that we love in heaven, that sounded more appealing, so we chose that. Now, I am saying that, I hope you understand the best of terms. We're not just choosing heaven over hell. Some people make the choice basically between those two things. I don't want to suffer, so I'd rather go to heaven, so I'm going to choose Jesus for that. I'm, I'm saying that we chose Jesus because we saw in him our ultimate happiness. So that's why we chose him, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's also why we chose and continue to choose to follow Jesus every day of our lives, even though it means, as we've been seeing, that we will suffer, even though we will be treated the same way that Jesus was treated. And the reason why we do this is because we believe the end result is going to be an even greater happiness. I mean, Jesus said in Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. By doing these things, we actually receive blessing on earth, but there's greater blessing and reward in heaven, and that is what we're seeking, greater happiness. Now, there's nothing wrong with pursuing happiness. We just need to make sure that we do it the right way, and this morning we want to consider how Jesus pursued happiness. Now, let's consider first that Jesus didn't pursue happiness by putting himself his needs, his comforts above the needs of others. And that's what I believe Paul is addressing in Romans 15 verse 3 when he says, for even Christ did not please himself. Now we need to understand what that means because Jesus was seeking pleasure. But he wasn't seeking pleasure. He wasn't seeking to please himself. So what does Paul mean by this? We need to understand this because Paul is telling us that this is what we are called to do as well. So we need to understand what Jesus was doing. Well, first we need to be reminded that Jesus, in coming into this world, in doing the work that he did, even in going to the cross, was seeking his own happiness. The author to the Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 12, verse 2. Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, the, the word joy that the author to the Hebrews uses here means happiness, for the happiness set before him, the blessedness that is set before him, the gladness that would be his, the great happiness that would be his. This is what Jesus was looking forward to when he went through his sufferings on the cross. This is what gave him the strength to see those sufferings, as the author to the Hebrews says, um, as nothing compared to the happiness that would be his. It says he despised the shame. It doesn't mean that he saw the shame and, and he hated the fact that he had to go through it, but he saw that shame as nothing compared to the joy that was set before him that would be his. Now, 
looking forward to this joy that's ahead of us is something that all of us are actually called to do. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 through 18. For momentary light affliction, and I think he's referring to himself here too. I mean, look at the catalog of things he went through in, I think it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, where he talks about all the stonings, beatings, shipwrecks, and exposure and all this. Momentary light affliction. I think that's setting aside the shame as, as nothing compared to what's ahead. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal or temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So Jesus looked at the things which are not seen. He looked at the eternal things. He saw the joy that was there, but he didn't look to the temporary things. Now, the point is, Paul is not warning us against pursuing happiness, against pursuing pleasure. He's warning us against how it is we go about it. Now, how did Jesus do it? Well, he didn't focus on himself. He didn't focus on his immediate happiness in this life. Paul writes, for even Christ did not please himself. Jesus took a very hard road to reach the happiness that he was pursuing. And we, we saw some of those things. I think it was last week. He became a man. That was a hard thing. It wasn't exactly enhancing his pleasure. He gave up the infinite happiness and the riches of heaven in order to come into this world to live in poverty and to live in a world of sinful, selfish people. If you're going to choose what's going to make you happy, that would be the last thing if you happen to be in heaven enjoying those things. But Jesus did it. He spoke the truth to people who hated the truth. He's shown the light in the darkness, and the darkness hated him, hated the light. Remember when he told the Jews in the synagogue, he read out of Isaiah a passage regarding the Messiah? And he says, today these words are fulfilled in your hearing. And they were amazed that he would say such a thing. And then he began to speak what was on their mind. And the next thing they were taking, they dragged him to the edge of a cliff and were going to throw him over the cliff. But then Jesus walked just through the middle of them and, and he left. But was Jesus seeking his pleasure when he did that? How about when he revealed to the Jews <laughs> that he was God? Which is, which is essentially what he did when he said in John 8, 58, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born... I am. And they picked up stones to stone him. Was Jesus seeking his immediate pleasure when he did that? He did what was right, even knowing that when he did what was right, it would provoke further hatred. Remember, he healed a man on the Sabbath. You know how the Jews thought about that, and they thought what Jesus was doing was wrong, even though hypocritically they would help an animal, but they would not help a man. The Jewish leaders, when they saw it, wanted to kill Jesus for doing that. That's why Jesus avoided Jerusalem, remember, for such a long time, because the Jews there wanted to kill him because he healed a man on the Sabbath. And Paul tells us in our passage that when he saw his father's house of worship desecrated, remember by the Jewish merchants who were taking advantage of the people, the money changers, everybody was, you can't use those animals, you need to use my animals, you can't use that money, you have to use the money of the temple. And every time a trade took place, the person you know, who, was, who was trading with them would lose and the merchant would gain. You've made my father's house a den of thieves. You're stealing from my people. Jesus was moved with such righteous anger that he made a whip and he drove them all out, overturning their tables, and that made them hate him even more. Now, this is what Paul means when he says in chapter 15, verse 3 of Romans, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. In, in all these things, essentially, they were dishonoring the Father by the way they were living, the things they were doing, and particularly what was going on in the temple. But Jesus stood up for him, and then they turned on him. So that reproach with which they were reproaching the Father then fell upon him was Jesus seeking his immediate gratification when he did that? No, 
Jesus didn't take the easy path. He continually sacrificed his own comforts and, humanly speaking, his own safety. Now, those who don't know Jesus as they read the Bible might be tempted to think that he was going out of his way to make other people hate him. Well, that's not what he was doing, even though that was the result. He was actually pursuing his own happiness, but not here. Now, Jesus, Paul tells us, was not seeking to please himself. So who was he trying to please? Well, first of all, he was trying to please his Father, and I think that's clear. The reproaches of those who reproached you, my Father and my God, have fallen upon me. This is what Jesus' life was all about, seeking to please the Father, doing what he knew would be honoring to him. Remember when Jesus said to his disciples, when they brought the food to him, when he was standing by the well in Samaria, remember he had the encounter with the Samaritan woman, they had gone into the city to get food. And Jesus had this encounter. When they came back with the food and they said, Master, eat, he said this in John 4, verse 32 through 34. He said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? They were thinking some, somehow he'd gotten some secret meal. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work, my food. This was his desire. This is what brought Jesus pleasure to serve his father, even though in doing it, as we've seen, brought about a great deal of suffering. The Father sent Jesus into the world to do things that, again, we saw were, were difficult in and of themselves. He sent him to be the kind of man that the Father could delight in. You know, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, one who loves him with all of his heart, one that obeyed him without question. The Father sent his Son into the world to guarantee the blessings of the covenant that covenant of life, that covenant of salvation, the reason why we're saved, the blessing of eternal life. He sent Jesus into the world to guarantee that that blessing would be available to everyone who believes, everyone who trusts in the Son. He sent Him to provide the only way that man could be reconciled to Him so that the war between us could end, so that He could adopt us into His family. He sent Jesus to provide an atonement a payment that would fully satisfy the Father's righteousness and justice. And what did Jesus think about all this? Jesus delighted in doing all these things. He didn't consider it a burden. It wasn't a burden to him because of what was in his heart. This was his food, he said to his disciples. And again, I would remind you of what David wrote of the Messiah in basically it was the psalm we use for our call to worship in Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Jesus rejoiced to do his Father's will. He took pleasure in doing these things because that was, is what was in his heart to do. That's what he wanted to do. And so in doing that, it was pleasing to him. So he was pleased in his heart, even though it meant he had to suffer outwardly. So Jesus came, first of all, not to seek his own pleasure, but to seek his Father's pleasure. And he found delight, even on earth, traveling such a difficult road in obeying Him and suffering for it because it was pleasing to the Father. But secondly, we need to understand Jesus also came to please us. Now, not to provide mankind everything that they might crave. Jesus did not come to do that. Although sometimes we hear that taught, even within the church, that is not what Jesus came to do. But He came to give to us, to give to His people what it is that we need and that is salvation. Because everything Jesus did for His Father directly benefits each one of us who are trusting in Jesus. 
His perfect life, His perfect obedience, His perfect righteousness is our covering. We trust in Jesus. That is credited to us. That's imputed to us. That's what it's meant that we are clothed with this perfect robe of righteousness. His death on the cross washed away all of our sins. That's why, again, why we have this spotless garment. It has no stain of sin upon it because Jesus has washed it all away. He took the full wrath of God on the cross for our sins. His atonement reconciled us to the Father. He sent His Son into the world for this reconciliation. Jesus brought it about. It was His pleasure to do it. And we're the ones who actually benefit from it. Now in trusting in Jesus, we are brought into the family of God. We are reconciled to Him. Jesus' teaching and His example, it was for our guidance so that we might know which way to go. His work provided the Spirit, the power to live like Him. As I said before, He didn't just give us a book and say, here, do this. He gave us the book, but He also gave us the Spirit to give us the desire to want to do what is written in the book. Jesus, in other words, who is the strongest, the stronger brother, bore the weaknesses of those without strength. He bore our weaknesses. He didn't seek his own pleasure, but he sought ours for our good, for our edification. He did basically what Paul is calling us to do. Again, here's the example of Jesus when Paul writes in verses 1 and 2 of Romans 15. Now, we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good. And then he points again to Jesus, for even Christ did not please himself. That is the example that we are to follow. Now, finally, the reason why Jesus did this, coming back to, it, uh, to the original point, he didn't please himself in this world. But he was pursuing pleasure, he was pursuing happiness, and he knew that taking this road would lead to his ultimate happiness. Again, I would remind you what the author to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, verse 2. Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, the author to the Hebrews is telling us what that joy is. That joy was his exaltation. And the path that he had to take to get there was not a path of immediate gratification. Paul actually summarizes all of this in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. He says, have this attitude in yourselves. Jesus is your example. Have the same attitude. Have the same motivation, the same goal, which was also in Christ Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself to the lowest place. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 20, verse 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. When Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many, he essentially was taking upon himself the curse of the broken covenant of works, the one that condemns all of us. He took that curse upon himself on the cross. Paul writes in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone, who hangs on a tree. Now, by the way, Paul does not mean that the law itself was a curse. The law is righteous and holy and good. It's just that we broke it and came under the curse of the law. So Jesus took that curse upon himself when he hung on the tree and he died in our place. So he, was, he humbled himself to the very lowest to serve us, even in serving us on the cross. 
seeking our good. And for this, he was exalted to the highest place of honor. There's nothing wrong with seeking after our own pleasure. We just need to make sure that we're looking for it in the right place, in the place that Jesus found it. This evening, we're going to consider how to follow this example of Jesus. And we're going to look back in chapter 14. We're going to talk about the stronger and weaker brother, and we're going to talk about what it means about stumbling or offending and so forth, and how we can follow Jesus' example of taking the role of the servant in seeking to help others rather than just doing what we want to do because it's pleasing to us. We need to think about what to do that will help others because that is what Jesus did. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask for the Lord to help us uh, to follow the example of Jesus. And let's also, as we are praying, ask the Lord to prepare us to come to the table as uh, we might remember what he has done for us and be encouraged by this example to follow him.